So I am thrilled to welcome Roz Chast uh, for her new book, Going Into Town, which is one of the most delightful books I've read in a long time. She began writing this as a guide for her daughter who was heading to college in New York City, and she wanted to provide tips about how to get around and what to do for fun, but wound up growing it into a book-length, charming, and quirky love letter to the city. Uh, with many hilarious bits. One of my favorite parts was her guide to Lower Manhattan, where the streets have names like, Now I'm Seriously Lost Causeway, and <laughs> Google is of no use road. Um, you surely know Roz Chast from her work at The New Yorker, where she's been penning cartoons for the magazine since 1978, usually featuring, as The New York Times described them in a profile earlier this week, as fuzzy and anxiety-fueled. <laughs> She's also the author of 10 other books, including her 2014 graphic memoir, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, which was a number one New York Times bestseller, a National Book Award finalist, winner of the 2014 Kirkus Prize in Nonfiction, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award, and there's even more accolades for that book. Uh, she was here to talk about that at Politics and Prose, and we're thrilled to have her back with us tonight. So please help me welcome Roz Chat. Well, I like to start with this slide because even, and I'll just, I'm going to read the slide, so don't worry in the back because I know it's very tiny. Um, this is this is Nature Girl. I'm really not a nature girl. I grew up in Brooklyn, and uh, I really, I didn't know anything really about, I did not have a lawn. Um, I, the only tree that I really knew was there was a tree outside of our kitchen window, and it had like this like rubber ring around the middle, and like it kind of had like these two like, staffs kind of thing. I, I see a lot of like nodding of recognition, people in the city that know this kind of tree. Um, but anyway, this is um, na Nature Girl in the Four Elements. So she does know water, it's in the bath. Uh, the air, it's the air conditioner. The fire is a toaster that has had a very unfortunate situation. And the earth is like, you know when you think, I'm gonna plant this avocado pit <laughs> and, and I'll grow an avocado tree. This never happens, at least not when you live in an apartment um, in Brooklyn. You know, let's see if, okay. Uh, I'm, gonna do, I'm gonna read a few cartoons first. Um, this is Pigeon Little. The sky is falling, the sky is, oh look, part of a bagel. Uh, this is the fountain of puberty. Um, I don't know if you can see it. It's, it's really just, you know, drawings. It's like things kind of grow. Can you see back there at all? Oh, oh, good, okay. Um, this is when moms dance. And, and people sometimes ask me, like, where do you get your ideas for cartoons? And a lot of times, I, don't, I really don't know. This one was actually, my daughter, when she was around 16, um, she was in the living room, and she was doing her homework. And, you know, there's almost nothing that's more revolting in the eyes of a teenager than the adult human body, you know? <laughs> But if you really want to gild that lily, do a little kind of like funky sort of dance. And I think I just wanted to see if she was paying attention, you know, partly. And so she was uh, doing her homework and listening to some music on the boombox. And I just kind of came in and started doing this kind of funky dance. And she looked up and she said, Mom, stop. You're hurting me. <laughs> and... Uh, I, uh, I asked her if I could use it as a line, and she said, okay. Um, this is self-help books for the newly dead. Um, with five people you should avoid in heaven, eating for eternity, and who moved my urn? Um, uh, this is a... Uh... <laughs> can you see? Oh, good. All right. Um, um, this is the not in the mood for human interaction line. Um, uh, uh, this is gasoline. We have regular and fabulous. Uh, this is just a kind of general declension. We have antiques, collectibles, bric-a-brac, and garbage. Um, 
And uh, this sort of sums up a lot of things. Uh, this is Insomnia Jeopardy. Uh, ways in which people have wronged me, uh, strange noises, diseases I probably have. Like, I have this like callus on my finger over here. I don't know why, I, why do I have this? Maybe it's not a callus. I don't know what it is. Um, uh, money troubles, why did I say or do that? And ideas for a screenplay. Um, it's an urban trail mix. Uh, um, <laughs> You have to have the almonds. Um, uh, I, I think of this man as Obit Man. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys read the obituaries. Um, I, I always check out the ages. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny that this thing is the idea of like checking your age against somebody else's age of death is apparently has been going on a long time because I was just reading ye old. Curiosity Shop, Dickens' novel, and there's this scene where these two um, ministers are sort of talking about um, somebody in one of their, their parishes who had died, and the age was 69, which was around their age. But then they start having this conversation about how women all, they generally lie about their ages, and so she was probably more like 80, and by the end of their conversation, they've gotten her up to 100. <laughs> Um, they just keep adding. It's, it was great. Just cracked me up. Um, this is the vain but realistic queen. Um, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who, if she lost 10 pounds and had her eyes and her neck done, could in her a and had the right hair cut, could in her age group be the fairest one of all? Um, and this is a... Uh, uh, awful. Uh, and this sort of sums up a lot of things for me. Too early to begin working on and too late to do anything about. Um, um, uh, this is the freelance life. Honey, I'm still home. Um, which, which leads me to talk, I want to talk a little bit about my process. Um, I work at home like all of my fellow cartoonists at The New Yorker. This is my desk where I work. Uh, there's about 40 of us on staff. Um, and we all submit every week a group of sketches, a group of roughs, uh, it's called, they're called. And these are like individual ideas for cartoons, uh, anywhere between like f maybe five and like 10 or 12 cartoons, you know, sketches a week. Um, so just uh, in, in the old days, sometimes people brought them in in person or faxed them in. Uh, most people, I think at this point, everybody, we send them through cyberspace. <laughs> and um, this is an actual photo that I took of cartoons going through cyberspace. <laughs> um, and then all of these cartoons, and it's, let's just say, if, to make it easy for me, I'm math impaired, that it's 10. So it's 40 times 10, that's 400. And then they get another, the New Yorker gets about another 400 cartoons from people who are not on staff. So that's like at least 800 cartoons every single week. And all of these cartoons, they get boiled down to about 100. And then these cartoons go to an art meeting. And the cartoon editor is there, who is now Emma Allen. She's the new cartoon editor. Um, and David Remnick, who's the editor of The New Yorker. And uh, a couple of other editors, just so it doesn't just become two people's taste. Um, and they have this weekly art meeting, which I have never been to. I don't ever want to go to it. <laughs> Um, I mean, unless they're just all like holding hands and dancing around the table saying, Roz is funny again. Well, we're just going to buy everything she submitted this week. We're not going to buy from anybody else, you know, unless it's this. But that is not what it is. In my mind, this is what, this is what I picture. <laughs> and it really is, it's mostly, it's mostly this, you know, it's, it's, be because they only buy about 20 or 25 cartoons a week. So the odds are stacked really highly against you. And most of what I do is rejected, and I do as well as anybody there. But this is why when somebody asks me, like my daughter, my son, you know, somebody wants to be a New Yorker cartoonist, what, and what, what should I tell them? And I always say, if they can do anything else, <laughs> 
That is the thing they should do. Um, because you really, uh, it, it still is horrible to get rejected. It's awful. And, and, and for me, you know, because of my, you know, own, you know, whatever, I, uh, <laughs> even if they buy a cartoon, it's, a, it's much better if they buy a cartoon than if they don't buy a cartoon. That's just a given. But sometimes what happens is I think, that this is when they are going to get closer to realizing the big mistake they have made. <laughs> and it's like, this is the point where they realize, you know what, we hate her stuff. <laughs> and now we know this for sure. So, you know, I, don't, I think that in general, most cartoonists I know, we're not like the most secure, uh, confident people in the world. Anyway, um, and so the, the cartoons that are rejected, they, uh, maybe because we get rejected so much, um, they get piled in my, into these filing cabinets in my studio, and at this point, they're piled up on top of the filing cabinets. And I do resubmit them. This is not a big secret or anything like that. We all do. Uh, I make a notation on the back of the month and the year when I did the cartoon, when I submitted it, so I can see how many times I've resubmitted it. <laughs> um, sometimes it's many, many times. Sometimes it's four or five times. But at this point, it's actually kind of wonderful because um, when I resubmit, I generally don't resubmit the cartoon as is, it gives me a chance to uh, sort of pull it apart and put it back together in a new way. Like maybe I'll change the title, maybe I'll change the order of the panels, maybe I'll like take out a bunch of words or I'll put new ones in. It gives me a chance to rethink it if I really like the, the basic idea. Um, so it's, it's, that's a good thing. Um, and uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about this memoir before I get into the new book. This is the memoir I wrote a couple years ago about my parents. It's called Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? And uh, it's a book I wrote. It's, it's about my parents, their relationship with each other, my relationship with them. And it really pretty much focuses on the last 10 years or so of their lives. Uh, they were born in 1912. They were old. Um, when they, for, especially for the 50s when they had me, I was an only child for uh, the, a lot of reasons, one of which is that they had a baby before me that uh, died um, shortly after birth. I think that was extremely difficult for them, and they waited another 12 years uh, before they had me. Um, anyway, uh, this is a picture of them um, and me, and the pi this picture makes me laugh a little bit because um, it's about 1960, but it, my, in my parents, my parents obviously think it's 1938, <laughs> um, which is, I think, the last time they like looked up and they saw what other people were, were wearing, you know. Um, so uh, this is the Wheel of Doom. Um, friends, husband. This is like these are the stories I heard growing up. Um, I mean, literally, the stories. Friend's husband killed by falling flower pot. Friend, friend nearly blinded by mascara causing infection. Friend who traveled too much, they got jaundice, a rash, then dead, a headache, then dead, a lump, then dead. He was too happy. He jumped off a chair and broke his metatarsal. Um, guy who almost died after playing the oboe. This is, um, this was a friend of my, my uncle's, my mother's brother, who he was a jazz musician. He knew this guy who played the oboe. I overheard him and my mother talking when I was about nine. You know when you're a kid and you overhear something that you wish you had not heard? <laughs> or, or you read something, like I remember reading, I, it was a Trixie Belden book, and her brother got bit, bitten by a rattlesnake and almost died, and, and Tracy Belden had to like, Trixie Belden had to like suck out the poison, and I thought, I wish I didn't know that. <laughs> that is a fact that is now in my head that I wish was not. You know, that there are such things as rattlesnakes. I'm probably, even in Brooklyn, I know I'm going to get bitten by a rattlesnake. <laughs> um, uh, you know, all kinds of things. like this. So, so the oboe story, I overheard my uncle and my mother discussing this, and my uncle said, yes, and he woke up, he was bleeding from every pore. <laughs> and it was just like, you know, even now when I hear that, I feel like I'm going to faint, you know? And um, they decided it was because he played the oboe and it was very hard to get a note out of the reed. And I guess so much pressure built up that like one morning, he just like, you know. Um, 
And there were such crazy, crazy stories. I was, I was not allowed to sit directly on the ground because my mother had a friend when she was growing up. She sat directly on the ground. She caught a cold in her kidneys. <laughs> and she died. Um, if you got water in your ear, that was the end. You might as well just hang it up. That's like the worst thing. The water would not come out on its own. I think like, it's like a panic. You know, if you have water in your ear, like after a bath, I'd be like in this like cold sweat, you know. Um, I did not swim without a bathing cap until I was about 17. This is a really good look. You know, when you're 14 or 15, you know, you're not self-conscious enough. You got that bathing cap on. It's so nuts. Um, my parents and I never discussed death. So, do you guys ever think about things? What kinds of things? You know, things, plans. I have no idea what you guys want. Let's say something happened. Am I the only sane person here? You know what? Forget it. Never mind. K sera sera. And later that day, phew, phew, phew. We, we, this is a terrible topic. Let's never talk about it again. Um, I'm, you know what? I'm going to move a little bit fast. Okay, this is a typical conversation that I had with my mother um, around this time. And I, sh I should say, they lived in that apartment in Brooklyn uh, where I grew up for 50 years. They lived there until they were in their early 90s um, independently. But I would come and visit them. I was living in, in Connecticut and I had two kids at home. And I am kind of a, a quasi driver. I mean, I drive locally, but I have a lot of you know driving issues. I didn't learn until I was 38. I'll get into that later. Um, but I would I would come into Brooklyn, and I and so I'm in the house and I pick up this oven mitt and it's like, Mom, what is with this oven mitt? It's from the year one. It's it's disgusting. It's all burnt and it's cruddy and it's got patches on it. I mean, who patches an oven mitt? You know. Um, Oh my God, these patches came from a skirt that I made 40 years ago in home ec, you know? And then it's like, it's becoming clearer and clearer, like nothing gets thrown away ever. Um, and please let me buy you a new oven mitt. And she says, why waste your money? That one still works, you know? Um, and then finally I did bring them to, uh, to a rest home. I brought them, uh, or my father called it a rest home. I brought them to an assisted living, that's what it's called now, an assisted living place. Um, and this is, you know, the, pretty much the first day that we're there. And my father says, so what do they call this place, a rest home? No, Dad, it's called assisted living. You know, I'm trying to put a brave face on this myself because it's, in some ways, it's, it's, it's horrendous because you know, there were these posters on the wall that were so weird, like, don't forget the trip to the mall. Jitney leaves the lobby at 1 p.m. Or this one, tonight's dining room theme is outer space. <laughs> and this, this was not the Alzheimer's wing. This was, this was just for people who maybe needed a little help, like with showering or whatever. They were like anybody else. I mean, do you... It, it was so just bizarre. It's like, why are you infantilizing these people? Um, and knowing, also feeling selfishly, like if I were there, and I will be, uh, unless an anvil falls on my head, you know, or <laughs> Trump does something really, you know, um, you know, then I don't want an outer space themed dinner. I want a regular dinner. Um, uh, Alfonso the Amazing does his magic act at 8 p.m. And, and you know, it's like a children's birthday party. And, and I'm still trying to put a brace. Look, they have a craft center. My mother is thinking, my daughter equals nitwit. Um, <laughs> and look, there's a gym and a little bar if you want to get a drink before dinner. And bingo, all day long. Has never been to a gym. Don't drink. Don't play bingo. And my mother says, I'm getting fatigued. Let's go back to our room. The first few months were fairly uneventful, although sometimes I had the feeling that my dad was less than 100% enthusiastic. <laughs> and he says, this place is a hellhole. <laughs> I knew it wasn't a hellhole, but even a top of the middle of the line or a bottom of the top of the line place is still an institution and institutions have rules. And you know, I would have these we weekly assessment meetings with the staff and this woman is saying, your father doesn't like to bathe, it was you know, very tough. My mother never called it a hellhole, but she had opinions. We're not residents, we're inmates. <laughs> um, 
I'm sure it wasn't easy, but they were adjusting. And my mother says to me, your father had an egg in his pocket all day yesterday. Thank God it turned out to be hard boiled. <laughs> well, um, my father died at 95, um, and my mother lived another two years. And uh, those last two years were not particularly good years. Um, and, you know, I, I think one of the reasons I wrote this book, I wrote it, there were a lot of reasons, but one of them was that this, this was unknown territory for me. Not, this is not talked about, you know, it's just not discussed. I didn't know the difference between a nursing home and assisted living. I did not know what a health care proxy was. I did not know my parents' social security numbers. I had to learn them, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I didn't know about this. This is Here's what I used to think happened at the end, and this is something I got probably from old movies on, you know, old black and white movies or Charles Dickens or something. One day, old Mrs. McGillicuddy felt unwell and she took to her bed. She stayed there for oh, about three or four weeks, growing weaker day by day. One night, she developed something called a death rattle, and after that, she died. The end. Rest in peace, old Mrs. McGillicuddy. It was not that. It was not that. Um, the ending was far more drawn out and painful and expensive and humiliating and just terrible. But I'm going to read this because this was not in the book. This ran in the New Yorker um, a couple of months ago, a few months ago. Uh, and there's an actually an epilogue to the story. At the end of the book, my parents' uh, ashes are in my closet because I did not know what else to do with them. They never expressed any does any speci specific, you know, they had no specific requests about where they wanted, they didn't have any specific requests about anything, really, because they didn't talk about anything. So um, they, were in my, they were in my closet. Um, but I'm going to see if I can read this while not disconnecting it. Uh-oh. Um, let's see now. Okay. Um, I'm just going to stand like, oops, wait, wait, wait. Okay. I'm going to read it like this. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. About a year and a half ago, I received an email from a woman who had read a book I wrote about my parents. Dear Roschast, I read your book, but there was a mystery that needed to be solved. She reassured me that she wasn't bats, that she was merely curious about where my parents' first baby was buried, because this was, you know, they, my parents did not want, they never wanted to talk about it. So um, her curiosity led her to a website called Find a Grave where she discovered something she thought I might find interesting. This is a total stranger. Um, chaste female, died December 21st, 1942, buried Mount Lebanon Cemetery in Queens. I did find it interesting. It was more information than I was able to get from my parents. So I contacted Mount Lebanon. Dear sirs or madams, blah, blah, archives, George and Elizabeth Chast, baby. The next day, I received this message. Dear Roz, I believe you have found your sister. I was way beyond flabbergasted. Not only had my sister turned up in the archives, but so had my mother's parents. That was all news to me. The man at the cemetery sent me <coughs> photographs of their graves. My parents' ashes, which had been in my closet since their deaths in 2007 and 2009, had at last found a home. Several months passed. After all, there was no rush. <laughs> you know. um, uh, <coughs> Finally, last fall, my son and I took a subway and then a bus to Glendale, Queens, where Mount Lebanon Cemetery is. I didn't bring the cremains. It was a two-part process, and this part was mainly for paperwork. We met with a man who had found my sister and my grandparents. He showed us a book of archived cemetery maps in the precise place where my sister was buried. He took us to a grave site, which was an unmarked, common in the case of an infant's death. My son and I put stones on her grave. Jews don't put flowers on graves, just stones. He showed us the niche wall where my parents' cremains would be housed. And he tells me, he says, it overlooks where your sister is buried. It's the only one left in that particular niche wall, and it's niche J2. J2, the apartment where my parents lived for almost 50 years where I grew up was 2J. <laughs> And this has been fact-checked by the New Yorker. It is absolutely <laughs> true. It has. It has. Um, the other day, I returned to Mount Lebanon, but this time with a pal and my parents' cremains. And I, you can't really see it very well here, but I'm on the subway platform with this big bag. Um, I was tempted to say to my fellow L-trained passengers, 
guess what or who is in this bag? <laughs> a workman drove me out to the niche wall. I carried the bag on my lap. We were joined by a group of workmen at the wall. One of them climbed the ladder, opened the niche, and one by one placed my parents' ashes inside. Then he resealed it and climbed back down. It was time to say goodbye. And this is the very first cartoon the New Yorker bought for me. And boy, was I surprised. Um, uh, let's see, do we have time to talk about this? Yeah, we have a little time. OK. Um, you know, in 1978, um, I was starting to do cartoons for The Village Voice and The National Lampoon. Um, and my dream was to be a cartoonist for The Village Voice. That's where I really thought, I mean, Stan Mack, uh, Jules Pfeiffer, Mark Allen Stamity, uh, people whose work was not really overground, it wasn't really underground, they just seemed to be very idiosyncratic and I thought that's where, you know, maybe that's where I'll be if I'm really, really lucky and work really hard. Uh, but my parents subscribed to The New Yorker. I knew that they used cartoons, of course. I mean, I always loved Charles Adams, you know, I was sort of obsessed with him and um, from the time I was a kid. And uh, I called them up. I found out when their drop-off day was. That's when, you know, people who just, you know, off the street or whatever, you know, submit their stuff. And I had no idea how to go about this, like how many to include in a portfolio. But I got everything I had together. I put together 60 drawings. I was sure they weren't going to take anything. Um, so I wasn't even like that anxious uh, about it because I knew that they weren't going to take anything. I, I was just kind of doing this because even you know in 1978 there were not many magazines that used cartoons. Um, when I went back the next week, there was a note from Lee Lorenz, who was the uh, art the uh, art editor at the time, and um, he said to come back and see him. And so I did, and he pulled out this cartoon and he said, we're going to buy this cartoon. And I was completely shocked for two reasons. First of all, that they were buying anything, because that was like not what I was expecting at all. Um, and also that they were buying this one, because this was like, out of all the cartoons I submitted, I would say this one was the weirdest and most personal. And the kind of cartoon, and I've been asked over and over, what does it mean? What does it mean? You know. And for me, it's like, I love to just kind of this is, I la when I draw, I'm drawing to make myself laugh. And I make up funny words. I make up like shapes. I just like draw like anything that like starts to make me feel like I'm gonna like laugh. So, um, and so it's the kind of thing like I have. I don't know. I won't even it takes too much time to describe. But um, I it's like <coughs> chant. I mean, you know, I do, maybe you don't do this. I do this. Um, so it's like very personal. And they did take it. And when, but I have to say, when my stuff, I was 23, when, I'm, when my stuff started to run, there were a lot of, of the old guard who were very, 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 very upset. And, and um, one of them asked Lee if he owed my family money. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is another really early one. Um, it's called In a Quandary, The Voice of Reason. It's not such a big thing. Just put the galoshes on. The Voice of Conscience. Mama would be mad if you don't put them on. The Voice of Practicality. It's raining. Why don't you just wear them? The Voice of Binky. Toss them out the window. <laughs> um, oops. Um, well, anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the new book. This is uh, the book that um, my new book, it's called Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York. And you can see there's a drawing of me with my mother. Um, I'm standing, oops, now why, oh, I see, I just touched it. Yes, and it's based on this photograph um, of me with my mother um, at our subway station in Brooklyn. I don't know how many sweaters I'm wearing under that coat. <laughs> um, I look a little bit disturbed, like, I think, Ma, I think something is wrong. I cannot breathe and I cannot put my arms down. Um, and why, these pants are very weird. <laughs> and, and yeah, so, uh, uh, but you know, you might ask, like, why if you love New York, why did you move? Um, so this is a little bit of background about that. When our son was almost three and I was pregnant with our second child, my husband, our son, and I left Brooklyn, because at that point we had moved from the Upper West Side. When he had one kid, we moved to Park Slope. 
And then with two kids, we were, we were out. Uh, my husband, my son, and I left Brooklyn for a pretty leafy suburb about an hour north of Manhattan. There were five main reasons for this leap into the unknown. I'd never lived in a house, or what I call, what we call in Brooklyn, a private house. Um, <laughs> you know, my husband had never, he's from Minnesota, he'd never heard the term private house. But when I was growing up, the question that we asked each other in grade school, there were two basic questions. One was, are you Jewish or Catholic? Um, I never met anybody who was not either, you know, <laughs> until I went to college. Um, and do you live in an apartment or in a private house? And, uh, you know, th but people who live in places where they're all private houses, they don't know this expression. Anyway, I'd never lived in one. One, this was 1990, the middle of the crack epidemic. We'd had it with crime, the crack vials all over the sidewalk, all of it. And this is my son, he's like saying, Mommy, what that? I eat that. <laughs> um, um, two, free excellent public schools where we were going. Three, my parents lived in Brooklyn. For some people, this would have been a plus, but I had uh, mixed feelings. Um, sometimes when you grow up in a place, you need to get away. I saw Brooklyn differently from people who came there from Wisconsin or wherever. Behind every cute organic food store, I saw the ghost of the sad, dark, odiferous grocerette of my childhood. There was nothing there for me. But the main reason was this. We couldn't afford the space we needed. The four-bedroom house we bought in suburbia cost less than a crappy two-bedroom walk-up in Brooklyn, even in 1990. The decision to leave the city was terrifying. And I have this drawing of my son, must play soccer. <laughs> Need mall now. And my husband is saying, lawn, extremely important. And I'm saying, hell with art collect thimbles instead. <laughs> um, I didn't know how to drive. I didn't like the idea of living directly on top of a boiler or a furnace or whatever the hell was in a house basement. And, and you know, I still don't. Um, I'd never lived in what my parents called the country. Also, would we become Philistines or zombies? And this is me, I'm, I'm in the front lawn. I'm saying, I own this tree. I mean, this still makes like no sense to me at all. Um, and this is like, I would, take my, I, I would take my daughter, my son, into trips, into the city with me on trips. We went all the time. And, my, and one time, my daughter pointed up at the fire escapes, and she said, Mom, what are all those West Side Story things? <laughs> you know, she knew the graphic. She was familiar with the graphic, but she had no idea what they referred to, what, they, what, it, what it was. Um, as our kids were growing up, I frequently took them into the city. I wanted them to share my love for my hometown, and I think that was it. I didn't want to, it wasn't just that I wanted to expose them to culture or whatever. I wanted them to love New York the way I loved New York. I wanted them to really love it. Um, but about a week before my daughter left for college in Manhattan, she went to school there, I decided to check up on her sense of logistics. So we're sitting at the counter, and I draw like a grid for her. I, and because and I'm saying, you know, Manhattan's great. It's, it's laid out on a grid. You can't really get too lost. And she goes, uh, what's, what do you mean? What's a, what's a grid? So, you know, I'm drawing this like this, and these are the avenues, these are the streets. So if you want to go from 52nd Street to 55th Street, you have to walk three blocks uptown. And she actually said to me, what's a block? <laughs> and you can see from my reaction, um, you know, there's, there's, we had some work we needed to do. Um, so I made her a book. I made her a little pamphlet. Um, and it was probably about like 12 pages, Nina's basic New York City book, focusing on the borough of Manhattan, because that's where she was living. And it just had like what I thought was key information, because as I said, I really wanted her to enjoy the city. And a lot of guidebooks, they tell you places to go. They tell you, you know, the theaters and the restaurants and the this is and the that's and where is it. But they don't tell you like basic sort of navigation, logistical kinds of things. Like Fifth Avenue divides the east side from the west side and the numbers. You have to know that, that you know, 25 west 43rd is really different from 25 east 43rd. Or maybe, you know, I mean, here in, in Washington, in big cities, there's sometimes a parallel to that. But, you know, 
these were very, some she just had no idea of things like that um, or the subways you know these are the east side trains these are the west side trains these are the cross streets you're going to hear the word cross street a lot and this is what it means and this is why you have to know it how to hail a cab you know this was before uber and stuff like that um, you know the, the light on top of the taxi if it's lit up it's empty if it's dark somebody's in the cab um, you know, just some really basic kind of stuff, where the major museums are located and, you know, uh, why the Metropolitan Museum is so great. Anyway, um, when I gave her that book, I had this hope that if she had the right tools for getting around the city, and of course some luck, because one always needs luck, especially in New York, she would fall in love with the city the way I did when I was just a few years older than her. I wanted to introduce her to Manhattan, and I didn't want them to get off on the wrong foot. Um, and here they are, it's like, play nice. Um, and, and, but as I was writing this book, it became more than this guide. It started, I started to think about, like, what is it that, you know, I'm so enthusiastic about New York. I love it so much. I feel so happy when I'm there. But what is it that I enjoy so much? And then I started to kind of explore that a little bit more. Um, and some of it was in the book for her, but, a, but most of it, was stuff that I started to write. It became a guide and this love letter. So, um, and some of it is really like, I don't even know why I like thinking about it, you know, because it's kind of weird. Like, the sidewalk in New York is like a thin shell covering a vast honeycomb of pipes and tunnels. The ground under which you are walking has been almost completely excavated. It is best if you don't think about this. <laughs> um, I mean, it really, it's just, sometimes you're at some, and, and I think also that like, it's, there's parts of it, like the subway system that are really old and sometimes you're like four stories like underground you know this you've walked walk walk you have to go and find like you know the G train and it's like four stories down and it's really old and you know from like the tile work the tiles are falling apart they're falling off the wall and there's like water running down the walls and that's not a good sign and maybe it's not water but it's like rat afterbirth or something <laughs> and and and, you know, I don't even care about the rats. I don't care about that. I'm talking about, like, structural integrity, <laughs> questions of. Um, so, and but then it's just like, la, 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 you know. Um, also, to a, great, to a great extent, everything in Manhattan is within walking distance of everything else. Between walking, biking, subways, buses, taxis, Uber-type apps, and everything else, who needs a stupid car? Um, so she's just saying good riddance. I mean, I hate cars. Um, also, um, I love density of visual information. And that is one thing that, that makes New York really different from every other city that I've been in. And I, I can see why somebody would love, like, I mean, people love London, they love Washington, they love Chicago, they love their city. But Manhattan is unique because it can't expand any bigger than it is. It's an island. And so you get this kind of crazy density. Um, you just pick like some nothing street and like Acme furs, ice skating supplies, air conditioner repair, ventriloquism school, perseteria, <laughs> wigs, buttons, brass polishes union. This really, you know, this is real. Smoothies, A1 dresses, cheese has snaps and more, you know, chess boards. It's just like all, and it's still, even though New York has changed, it's still like that. And you know, sometimes like in the middle of a block like this, there's a tower that is like, you know, million dollar condos. And that cracks me up, you know, like you're next to like the button store. You know, <laughs> you know, you're not in some fancy neighborhood. I mean, there are fancy neighborhoods in New York, but you're, there's also a lot of like, you know, kind of junky stuff around you. So, ha ha. Um, um, and also, just like all kinds of stuff on the street that cracks me up. Like, I like, I kind of like standpipes. They're really anthropomorphic and weird to me, and there's so much variety. Um, and once I started noticing them, I started to really notice them. Like this one over here on the, on the left, I think of her as Trixie. <laughs> and um, she's kind of saucy. Um, I think she might also be a little into S&M. Um, and then there's like weird, like the weird snaky thing happening in the upper right with a nobody sees me sneaking out over here. <laughs> they, won't, they won't notice that I've like snaked out over here. And this, this lower right-hand corner, this is definitely an old married couple. <laughs> Do you see it? And they've, they've, just had, they've just had this, like, stupid fight, you know? And, and she's saying, she's saying, I'm not, I'm not talking to you. And he's saying, what do I do? 
He's like, oh. <laughs> no, forget it. Forget it. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> I'm like, what is that? <laughs> what is happening here? <laughs> It's like this little family. It's just so funny. There's Papa Bear and Mama Bear. And, uh, and then this one. Oh, yeah, wait, wait, wait. The, I mean, when I saw this, it's like some weird, like, multi-armed Indian goddess has been blended <laughs> with a steam pipe. I mean, I just, you know, it just made me laugh. It just cracked me up. Um, and also, when I'm in New York, I think it's because of this incredible density that, I, well, I overhear conversations or I have weird conversations with people. Like this one, um, it happened, it was around 10, 15 in the morning. And I was walking and I decided just on the spur of the moment, I went into this like weird off-brand uh, co cosmetic store. Um, and this was before Sephora, because uh, <laughs> that kind of killed this kind of thing. And there's this woman, and she's you know got a ton of makeup on, and uh, this sort of strange sweater with like the shoulders cut out. And uh, she goes, "Hi, can I help you?" And I say, "Yeah, I'm looking for a new lipstick." And she says, "You should try our special line. Put it on in the morning, and it never comes off." <laughs> and then she leans over me, and she says, "Look." I just ate a salad! <laughs> and I'm thinking like, who eats a salad at like 10.15? I mean, it's like way too early. Um, you know, I'm not gonna read this, this is too long to read. Um, also, the more nondescript your street is, the greater chance you have of making your own discoveries. And that's, that's the other th thing that like, this, this book is not about my telling you, go to this place because it's so great, go to this place because I love it so much, go to this. I say, walk around and make your own, you know, New York is big enough that everybody can make their own New York. You know, it's not just like these 20 things that you have to, I've never been to the Statue of Liberty. I mean, I know I should go. I have a lot of guilt about that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you make your own, you make your own city. You make your own, you know, there's, there's infinite ways of doing it. Um, uh, this is uh, about go, I, I wanted to include something about the Met, which is my Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is my very favorite museum ever, because it's so huge, you never can see all of it. Um, so sometimes I go, I make up stories for the paintings. Um, so this, this painting comes from my personal favorite era in art. It's like very early Renaissance when they know some pers perspective rules, but clearly not all of them. <laughs> and. And they like, maybe they think like, I'm not gonna notice, but I notice, you know? I mean, I understand, and also I understand, you know, completely, because, you know, there, that happens. Um, but the colors are always very beautiful. So this is, um, th this is, this guy's kneeling, and he goes, oh, wise men, forgive me for making your house levitate. <laughs> and, and the wise man says, perhaps you didn't mean to, but still you must be punished. And these other guys are going, oh, goody. Um, <laughs> You know, they look kind of excited. Or here's, here's this one, and I love the expressions on the faces of these women. Um, one of them is kind of pretty, and one of them is sort of homely, and the pretty one is holding out this, like, these herbs or something, and I call this one the Bristnik sisters. Um, uh, poor Marsha, not much in the looks department. Maybe these magical herbs will help. And Marsha just looks out at the viewer, and she says, you guys are listening to this dimwit, right? Um, and this one is called Put Something On. Um, put this on. Put this on. You can't go around naked. No. Put it on. No. Put it on. Damn it. Bite me. <laughs> um, or get fashion tips. Look at this haircut. This is, this is a Zazera. It's, it's really, that's what it's called. It was the in style in late 15th century Venice. Um, but maybe the best thing about the Met is that even at the height of the tourist season, what some people call the holidays, when Manhattan can seem a tad too crowded, you can always find a place to be alone. I mean, you really, you just go to that, you know, Etruscan vases. There's like nobody there. Um, um, you know, I, I'm running a little bit late, so I am going to skip a couple of things here. Uh, okay. Um, in 1949, E.B. White wrote one of the best books ever about New York City called Here is New York. 
In it, he wrote that there were essentially three New Yorks. First, there was the New York of the person who was born here, who takes the city for granted and accepts its size and its turbulence as natural and inevitable. Secondly, there is the New York of the daily commuter, who arrives for work every morning and leaves every evening for home in the suburbs. You will almost never see this New Yorker wandering around aimlessly or sitting on a park bench. The commuter gives New York its title, restlessness. Last of all is the New York of the person who was born somewhere else and came to New York in quest of something. And I love this quote so much, not only because I think it's absolutely true and put so beautifully, but also because I feel like I'm a member of all three of those groups. Um, I was born there, and so I'm actually more skeeved out by like real quiet and dark and like where we live in Connecticut, like my husband thinks this is funny um, because there's places where, you know, I always say it's really dark, like we're driving and like suddenly there's no like overhead lights. And it seems to always be the same place on this route. I get kind of like, it's, no, it's really kind of dark here. <laughs> and he says, yeah, because it's night, you know. <laughs> um, and, and the commuter, I've you know lived outside of the city for 26 years, so I've never commuted for a, a job. But you know, I know that feeling of taking the commuter train. Um, and last is the questers, the people who came to New York in quest of something. And I feel like I was born in Brooklyn, and now Brooklyn is a destination for a lot of young people, which is really great. But when I was growing up, Brooklyn was the place that you wanted to get away from. I mean, it really was, you know, this was in Saturday Night Fever, and it was not really an exaggeration. It was like New York, Manhattan was called New York, and New York was the shining city on the hill. And if you had any, like, dreams, you know, you wanted to be a dancer, you wanted to be an actress, you wanted to, you know, be a writer, that's where you wanted to be. You didn't want to be, um, you didn't want to be in Brooklyn. You wanted to be in Manhattan. Um, and so, in many ways, that, is the group that I most feel in common with. And the book is not only a love letter, but it's also a letter of deep, deep gratitude because I do feel like New York took me in, you know, and, and I love it so much, so much, so much for that. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna close out with a few cartoons here. This is Nancy Drew, The Later Years. Um, Nancy Drew and the Missing House Keys. Um, <laughs> I know, I put them right there. <laughs> Nancy Drew and the Mystery of the Eight Pounds. <laughs> How did I gain eight pounds? I eat nothing. Nancy Drew and the Secret of the Computer. You and I are gonna be great friends. Um, this is the Holy Trinity. Uh, salt, butter, and sugar. Uh, this is In a Just World. I don't know if you can read it back there. There is a little boy with a dunce cap. It says dunce, and the teacher is wearing a bitch cap. Um, um, and from time to time, I get obsessed with these hobbies. I don't know why. I just get really compelled to learn a certain craft. And some of them work with my style, and some of them don't. These Pisanki eggs love, love, love doing them so much. They're not painted. They're dyed. You draw on the egg. Uh, with wax, and then you dip them in vats of dye, and so you have to uh, think where the, where the wax is, the paint won't go. So you have to think in the negative, which for some reason comes very easily to me. Um, <laughs> uh, it turns out Charles Adams also pa uh, painted eggs. These are not Pisanki, but these are his eggs, and he uh, drew them. Um, I also got really into rug hooking for a while. I like birds, I have two parrots. Um, this is a rug I made of my father. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he would have these, these breakfasts that would, he retired early and he loved to have, like he would make himself these like breakfast lunches, these brunches, these things. He would take everything out of the refrigerator and he didn't eat all these things, but he liked having them sort of all around. <laughs> and, and this would drive my mother bananas, you know? But as an adult, I completely understand this, which drives my husband bats because it's like, Maybe you're eating at home, you're eating like roast chicken, but like maybe you want a piece of monster cheese in the middle of it, you know? So why not just have it there, you know? Um, you know, is, is there a law? Um, 
<laughs> you know. Um, also, I got like seriously. This is my latest craft. I've gotten seriously into embroidery. Um, it's it's kind of nuts. This one uh, is my one of my very favorite quotes. Uh, it comes from the the Polish poet Czesław Milos. Uh, when a writer is born into a family, the family is finished. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sort of a jolly little quote. Um, and that led to, I wound up doing a cover for the New Yorker, which was embroidered. And they photographed the, the piece of embroidery. It was a Mother's Day slash tech, tech issue cover. So it was the tech issue, but it was Mother's Day week, and that's a motherboard. Um, and uh, it was really fun. It's not an act, it's, it's a com composite of like a million motherboards, just like, like I, know, I don't have no idea, like this is not accurate. <laughs> um, it's just like, oh, that, that's kind of, that looks like it'd be fun to embroider, but you know. Um, and I'm gonna close out with a couple of cartoons, dousing for coffee. Um, I love, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, thanks. Um, I think we're going to do Q&A now. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. All right, two is good. Two is good, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. You can just, no, you can just shout it. Just. The, the question is, is the fact that my daughter is named Nina any relation to Hirschfeld? It wasn't a conscious decision, no. But um, any, uh, you know, I'll just repeat the question. Oh, oh, here you are. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, what advice do you have for someone who can't do anything else? Who can't? <laughs> then do it. Yeah. Then definitely be, go for it. You know. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, what did I think of Bob Mankoff's uh, book, uh, How About Never? Well, now that he's no longer my editor, I can tell the truth. No, uh, um, no, I thought it was, I thought it was wonderful. Um, he's, in person, he's the funniest person I think I've ever met. He's really hilarious. Um, and I thought it was a funny book, really good. And maybe one more question? Yeah. How old, how old were you when you knew you wanted to be a cartoonist? Um, how old was I when I knew I wanted to be a cartoonist? I think I started, drawing sort of cartoonishly probably when I was little like four four or five I mean I always liked to draw but I loved cartoons and I loved um, making something that I thought was funny was like magic to me you know and like laughing when I see something that makes me laugh it's like magic it, like I don't know anyway I think we're, we're kind of I'm gonna let you guys go um, and oh oh, come, oh don't go don't go buy books sorry Thank you.